Okay, it's uh, 4.40 in Eastern Time, and I wanted to go ahead and get our talk started on fundraising. Hi, everyone. I'm Laurie. I am here. Rep I am on the Delegate Council Steering Committee, and I'm um, first Vice President of the Ohio Genealogical Society. Um, and honestly, I volunteered to lead this one because this is something I've been working on <laughs> with OGS. And I am really um, anxious to kind of hear what everyone else is thinking and feeling about fundraising because I sure know we've been uh, trying very hard for the last six months to get a campaign going. So I thought maybe we'd start with if everyone could quickly introduce themselves and just tell us what society you're with, maybe that would be helpful. Um, Leanne, would you like to go first? Sure, I'm with Mita Y DNA. It's a website, username, everything is free. So all our funding has to be through donations or grants. Okay, all right, uh, Marilla? I'm with the African American Genealogy Group of Philadelphia, and currently we have donations, and we don't do much fundraising, so I'm just trying to get a feel of what it's all about. Okay, Gail? Hi, I'm with uh, the West Houston Area Genealogy Society. Uh, we're pretty small. Uh, we have about 40 members, and We've just started a donation program uh, with our uh, membership um, renewals. And we just need to get on the, the bandwagon because uh, moving into a hybrid uh, meeting platform is going to uh, take some, some money. We wanna be able to make sure that we can fund it. Okay, Alan. Hi, I'm Alan and from McDonough County, Illinois. Uh, small genealogical society, um, by my view, because we're in a small rural community in Illinois, in West Central Illinois, um, we have our own facility, uh, which uh, we pay rent uh, to the museum in, and our fundraising has basically been through uh, membership, um, donations, and the selling of our publications. Mm -hmm. All right, and then Deborah. I'm with the Claremont County Genealogical Society in Southwestern Ohio. <laughs> yes. So we, we are a chapter of your society. Yes, uh, yes, you're just east of Cincinnati. Yes. Uh, right. We are having uh, a bicentennial next year of the birth of uh, U.S. Grant. And so there are several programs being planned for that. So that's one of the items we would consider fundraising for to whatever project we are going forward with. But our main fundraising goal is to be able to purchase a, some type of digitization equipment mm -hmm. so that we can digitize some of the records in the record center and then get them indexed. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm facilitating this, but you know, let's talk about what what we want to, but let me just throw a question out to get us going. What would you say your major challenge is with fundraising? We've never done it. Besides uh, dues and just now, like I said, starting a donation program. Mm -hmm. That's it, it's never been a campaign in order to raise money to you know, move ourselves forward. I think our society members, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, have had issues with, are we even allowed to do that and not be crossing our nonprofit tax status? So I need to be able to clarify to them what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. We don't have any volunteers for the committee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, as ours, wait, yeah, okay, nope, am I back yet? Yes, yeah. the um, Mita Y, uh, we were worried about how to fundraise, so I actually talked to NGS, I said I'd have some questions, they were great, they answered my questions, because yeah, there are, like Deborah's wondering, there are certain places that you can 
and other places, if you want to do a campaign, was what I was looking at, was because NGS did this wonderful campaign a few months ago. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay, how do you campaign like that? And basically, we found out there's, you, yeah, 42 states, you have to pay about $10,000 to get the license to campaign uh, for all states in the United States at one time. There's eight that you can't live being within our state. Like our, we're registered in Maryland. That's different. That because you are residing in Maryland, so you can do your state. But going everywhere, that's mm, NGS has got good resources, though. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, even at a state level society like Ohio, we we tried this year to create a campaign for the first time. And it's just now closing out. Uh, we worked on that for about six months, developing a campaign theme, um, figuring out how we were going to approach our, our major donors. So people who had given a fair amount in the past to our building campaign or whatever. Um, and then how to just approach you know, more general public, you know, but it included things like sending an email, sending a letter, sending, um, doing Facebook posts, those kinds of things. But we, even on our committee, because none of us are professional fundraisers, we were tapping into resources from the internet, you know, like from non, from like, um, organiz like National Council of Nonprofits or something. I can't remember the exact name of the organization, but they actually had some good materials on how to run a fundraising campaign. And so we honestly were trying to just be good researchers and read, it, read a book basically on how to do it because none of us really knew how. So we kind of had to train ourselves. And what we kept telling ourselves was even if we do you know, an average job of this, we're still going to make more money than if we don't do anything. And we just forged ahead. And the next thing that I, I've been kind of project managing it, you know, um, kind of keeping everybody on track and here's what we need to do this week and let's make sure that we get these materials produced and all that. What I want to do next is at the end of the campaign is I want to do what a project manager would call a retrospective where we look back at everything we did and we document what we did and what we think worked and what we think didn't work so that we have we're not starting all over next year good idea yeah and i mean last i heard we've we've made some money i mean is it everything we need to make probably not and i'd say our other challenge is we know that there are, if we were smarter about how to do corporation, you know, get corporate funding, corporate grants, that we need to be learning how to do that. Because we were just going to individuals, but we know that's the next thing we need to do. And we also need to get smarter about just applying for grants generally from, you know, organizations that give grants. But, but we feel like there's kind of a three-prong approach. There's like a general campaign to individuals. There's one to corporations and then there needs to be grant writing so I you know even at a state level organization level I think we're we're still going to be trying to figure all, out how to do that but I, I guess the thing I would say is d there's plenty of materials out there to tell you how to get started and you're going to make more than if you do nothing as far as grant writing do you typically look for somebody who is skilled in that actual area because my understanding is is you need a good grant writer in order to get the grant yeah yeah we have one volunteer who has done it before so we're thinking of going you know having tapping into their experience but you know if our state you know we're state society we have only three paid employees so and um, one of them's an intern. No, well, we should have four. We're looking for a new executive director. So w we have a few paid employees, but the, you know, all of these kinds of efforts are board members. You know, they're board members and they're committee members. And what we do is we, you know, that kind of goes back to board recruitment. Can you find people to get onto the board or to get onto your board committees who have those kind of experiences? Deborah? 
Yes, I'm a life member of the Kentucky Genealogical Society. Mm -hmm. And years ago, they used to offer grant writing classes. I don't know if they're still doing that, um, but I attended some a couple of times uh, to get ideas. And another thing that I was wondering about that some of our society members have suggested is, is there a way for nonprofits to use the GoFundMe type things where you, you put your goal up there and this is what you're trying to raise and can you do that and not have to pay taxes? <laughs> right. Yeah, I, would, I, think, I think you definitely have to speak to your, you know, if your organization has an accountant on that or try to, you know, get that kind of advice. I would talk to, it's Matthew at NGS. I think it is, and ask him. Yeah, he, Matt, Matt Manashis. Yeah, he's the executive director of NGS, and um, he he will respond. You know, if you use that face, Facebook group, and he's willing to, as he said this morning, he's willing to share his advice about those kinds of things because he's a professional nonprofit executive. Yeah. You know, he's run multiple organizations, and that's, you know, that's honestly where a lot of, all of us are struggling because we aren't necessarily, don't have that life experience, and he, you know, so that's an area that NGS can help. I'm asking big corporations. I love that, Lori. How do you do that? Any advice, any experience on begging well, and, for money? <laughs> well, and we haven't done it yet, but here's what I've learned is that you have to do it early in the year because you have to do it right like end of, a end of the calendar year because organizations are setting up, they are making their decisions about who they're going to fund early in a year. So that that's one piece of advice. Um, so you'd, know, you'd need to know their fiscal year. Knowing their right. fiscal year would be right. helpful. Right. It's not everybody's right. calendar. Well, and for the organizations, I mean, yours isn't geographically based like some of the rest of us are, but, you know, it's also knowing the funding organizations in your state. Like, for example, our, you know, Ohio Genealogy Society, we serve the whole state. However, we're based in, in Richland County. And the Richland Foundation, you know, has, we get funding just even, even though we're a state organization from our local kind of umbrella foundation. Yeah. Um, so we're able to participate in some of their events. So, you know, sometimes there are local organizations like that, that are kind of an umbrella funding organization that perhaps you could get help or advice from. I live in Columbus and in Columbus, it would be the Columbus Foundation is that group. Right. So there's usually a group right. that perhaps you could network with. Yeah, I'll, I, I work with AGS, Alberta Genealogical Society. And yes, we have a couple of those. So I'll mm -hmm. have to look in Maryland. Right, right. I. I think that, again, it's just something that probably we, I would love to see NGS give training on how yeah. to, yeah, oh, good. Look, look who showed up right at the right time. Oh. Um, hey, Matt. <laughs> Hi, so, everybody. So, oh. <laughs> so we're, we're talking, actually, we're talking about corporate funding for yep. organizations. And what we're, you know, we're kind of all expressing that there's just, you know, knowing how to how to go after corporations and knowing how to go after grants is something a skill set that we don't have, and we're trying to you know get more smarter about that. Like, if right. you are like, for example, a couple of us in this group are in Ohio, for example, um, how do you get smarter about how to approach companies for funding? Yeah, that's a. This is the. The hardest thing about running nonprofit organizations is fundraising. So you're in the right place because Lori's smart um, and she's doing it for Ohio Genealogical Society. So, um, you know, the, the biggest challenge in reaching out to corporations is really understanding what they are trying to achieve, right? They're not going to give you money 
as a charitable deduction, right? They may, um, and many of the organizations that you are going to reach out to for for sponsorships, uh, for your events, or for just general giving, um, they're going to write it off as a charitable contribution. Um, but more likely, they're going to take it out of their marketing budgets. And because it's coming out of their marketing budgets, you need to understand what they're actually buying, which is access to your members so they can sell their products. And it's having that conversation with them um, that really will lead to the kinds of returns that you'd be looking for in corporate sponsorships or corporate fundraising. Um, they're not gonna do it out of the goodness of their hearts, typically, though some organizations will. Uh, because they believe in participating in their own community. Um, Ancestry is very good at that, not to throw out names of any individual organizations, but there are companies that recommend Family Search. They're in it because they want to grow the community. Um, but for a small um, genealogical company, um, more likely they need something in return for that investment in you. And that is, in the language of a company, is hot leads. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for names and addresses of people who are interested in their products and services. So once you've shifted your mindset to away from what you're trying to get them to do for you and what you can do for them, you'll be much more successful. And it requires having an individual conversation with whomever it is at the company. And the first question, or the first thing out of, you know, when I do this, the first thing out of my mouth isn't, we have a platinum, silver, gold sponsorship. It's at $10,000, $5,000, $1,000. It's, what are you trying to achieve for your company? Um, what product service are you launching? What's coming up next on your marketing calendar? Where can we help you achieve your objectives? That's really what it comes down to for the corporate stuff. Mm -hmm. And then what about the grant like grants. So, yeah. you know, if you're a genealogy society, you're a cultural organization, you know, yep. you could, you could think about going for, you know, something related to history or, you know, social, cultural, something yep. like that, that there, exactly. you know, those kind of things exist in most states. They do. Uh, so uh, I'll give you two thoughts on, on foundation grants. Um, I'm not going to talk about government grants right away, but foundation grants. You're going to be more successful as a genealogy organization working with the foundations within your state who give to arts and cultural and humanities issues. So figure out who those foundations are. They may be large. In some states, there are multi-billion dollar foundations that still have programs that are dedicated to their local community but more likely they're gonna be family foundations that are working within a state, a region, or a local community. Um, you can find out information about those grant making organizations from the internet. There are fantastic resources and aggregators of information about foundation grant makers. Um, Candid, which is uh, provides services like GuideStar and some others um, is one place to go to look for um, for that information. Um, and so with that said, now I'm going to give you the, the reality. Um, so before I came to genealogy, I worked in the environmental and conservation field for almost 20, well, almost 20, 30 years. Um, both in the not-for-profit not organizations and government uh, world. And the statistic we used at that time, um, and it was relevant to the conservation field, but it holds for not-for-profit organizations more broadly is, um, there is an order of magnitude difference between the number of foundations who provide grants and the number of not-for-profit organizations who are seeking grants, right? So at that time we talked about there were 7,000 conservation funders and 70,000 conservation organizations looking for money from those 7,000. The same holds true in arts, humanities, and culture. 
Um, so it is extremely competitive. It, it can be successful. NGS hasn't even approached that well yet um, because we find our fundraising from our individual members, direct donors, direct givers, and from corporations at this point is where we want to put our energy and time. On the government side, you're more likely to be able to get from local government, state government, than you will from the feds. Um, the feds are actually asking for money, and NGS and FGS before it actually raise money for the National Archives and Records Administration, right? Mm -hmm. So unlikely we're going to get money from NARA or from USCIS or from the National Endowment of, for Humanities. Um, we're actually raising money to give to them. Right. So um, I would steer away from government for this point, the federal government, local and state may be possible. So would it be true then for both companies and for um, grants and fundraising, you start close in geographically? I, I think that's always a good strategy. And your, your strategy with grant makers is going to be different than for your corporate funders, but ultimately they're the same. It's about developing a relationship. Before you ever ask for money, you've got to develop the relationship with the right person in that company or that foundation. Um, many foundations uh, do not accept unsolicited um, requests for grants. Um, and many corporations, they don't put it in those terms, but Typically, they want to have a relationship with you before they will fund, fund you. How do you start that relationship? Well, um, that's a great question. Was that Deborah? That was I Gail. Uh, uh, De I don't know why I don't see it. Everybody. I, oh. I think we should donate. I, I was just thinking as Matt was talking in, in Gail's question, go to them, find out who it is, and volunteer to do their genealogy for them. <laughs> Yeah, that, cool, that's, there you go. That's, a, that's an entry, right? Uh, and yep. quite frankly, uh, New England Historical Genealogical Society does stuff like that, right? Um, so there is opportunity to, um, to make stuff like that happen. Um, no doubt you can create a relationship that way. Um, the other important thing about creating relationships is if you are already doing a small expo hall, small uh, exhibition at your event. That's where those relationships are formed and made, particularly if we get back to on ground. But I, at, for 20 years as an executive director, when I host a show, um, I, I hate to admit it, but there is half a day when I do not pay attention to my individual paying members because I am walking that show floor taking care of vendors. Um, and it's not because I don't value my individual members, but it, it's because I have one day a year um, that I can spend on the show floor walking around and, and having developing relationships with those partners who pay me, you know, in some cases, five, ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 a year. Um, so that's just, that's just part of it. And if you've got a small event and you've got genealogical vendors that are coming to exhibit at your event, you're gonna take care of them. Good advice. I'm just thinking from an organization that has less than 50 members of which maybe 20 of them are active and 10 of us at maximum do all the work. So, one, of the yep. things that, one of the things that I've done is, is had our society join the local chamber of commerce because at that point they normally have a social once a month or whatever in which all the business leaders of each of the corporations are there. So you start making that inroad. And then the next thing I did was hit them up for you know advertising because we were putting out a historical journal. So why not put the history of your company in there and get all your people and names in there, which they really bought into. Um, so th that really helped, you know, at least get you in the door. Uh, absolutely. I, I think mo many people 
um, underestimate the value of a relationship with their chamber of commerce. And okay. uh, particularly for small local organizations, it's, it's critical. Love that. Deborah, you raised your hand. Yes. Uh, he, he brought up a question that wasn't the one I was planning. He, he mentioned that he advertises. And our society, ha I've been approaching uh, funeral homes in the past to get them to put ads in our newsletter to help cover the cost of the newsletter so that we can still mail copies to our members that don't use the internet and computers. And, and the issue has come up where they said, no, we shouldn't call it an advertisement. We should call them a sponsor that taking I can, advertisement I can, might, I can might explain. be considered profitable. I, I can explain that in two sentences for you. So advertising is taxable to not-for-profit organizations, but typically is not if the cost of that advertising um, fulfillment, um, the cost of producing the newsletter, for instance, offsets the revenue. Okay. So, so there is no taxable liability if you have no income. If the income and the expense are the same, there's no taxable liability. That said, okay. sponsorship revenue is not taxable under federal rules. It is considered a royalty payment, which is non-taxable. So it's easier to do that. Sponsorship usually associates with a benefit accrued to the sponsor. Well, the way I approach that, that that's, I, that's a I, tough, tough thing to do because there are also rules about what you can and cannot do for sponsorships. Okay, what I usually do when I approach them is I say, most of our members are all over the country. They're not aware of the funeral homes in the area. And nowadays, the way people have to pay for their obituaries, if they know the funeral homes and the funeral homes are the ones posting the obituaries, that brings them to that group. Or I also have a monument company that I've contacted in the past. And, and that gives them opportunities for people in the future to use their services because a lot of people come back to the local county to be buried or to to order a monument but the main issue that I was going to ask originally was we want to digitize so we were looking for opportunities for grants in digitization which I don't know I know the government has offered them through their humanities and and um some state organizations have offered them. Kentucky does for Kentucky organizations. So that's that's what we were wanting in our immediate need. Right. For something like that, I would wonder, depending on the state, about you know state libraries, state records preservation, those kinds of organizations. That's exactly right. That's where just thinking strategically about what you're trying to accomplish and who else might be uh, interested in helping you accomplish that becomes valuable. So Lori's exactly right. If the first people to talk to in your state are gonna be the state archives uh, or the state library. And if they don't have a resource for you specifically, they may be able to provide the referral. And that's all you're looking for ultimately is when, you know, you're creating a snowball, basically, referral to referral to referral until you get the person who says yes. So if we're selling publications that we're putting out, is that, um, and the money we have in that, is that taxable or not taxable? Selling publications, um, right. like well, a book? Correct, like a history book, or we're putting together a history of a not Not non-taxable. And mission so, related. So as long as we're selling these books, it's a non-tax, we don't have to charge tax. Correct. You're offsetting the expense, the income with the expense and anything else that's going right back into the mission of your organization is non-taxable. The issues for taxation in nonprofit organizations are around advertising, which is taxable, sponsorships, which are non-taxable, and exhibit income, even in a virtual world, but 
when you're on a trade show floor, the sale of that booth to an exhibiting company specifically written into the law as non-taxable to the organization. 